If you're getting ready for NBA All-Star Weekend 2023, hopefully your hotel room didn't get canceled. We'll explain. The January 6th committee report and documents discuss two Utahns. One tried to overturn the election, according to the committee. The other was convicted of a crime. With such a snowy disaster in Buffalo and much of the Northeast United States, we're going to take a look at why their snow is different from ours. It is going to turn stormy. I'll let you know what the timetable is, and we'll look at how far out the storms go into the Pacific coming up. Live from Utah's news leader, Fox 13 News Live at 5 starts now. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm April Baker filling in for Bob and Kelly tonight. The NBA All-Star Game in Salt Lake City is only a few months away, but a local hotel's mix up with the NBA has some families without anywhere to stay. Fox 13 News investigative reporter Adam Herbetz is at Vivint Arena with their story. Well, this is the first NBA All-Star game in Utah since 1993. That's 30 years. And for people who booked at the Courtyard Marriott, that's because it's supposed to be convenient. It's just a couple steps away. Well, if you made that decision, turns out it's actually very inconvenient and it's going to be expensive. I'm sure there's lots of people out there in the same boat we are. Sure, Ronnie and Jenny Jerome are big basketball fans, but that is nothing compared to their eight-year-old granddaughter, Mia. She's, she's really into basketball. She's, she's really into uh, the jazz. Donovan Mitchell used to be her favorite jazz player, and she was getting ready for a possible reunion at the 2023 NBA All-Star Game. She's old enough now at the age of eight to, you know, where she can enjoy it and remember it. That's one of the reasons her grandparents booked a room right next to the arena, almost a year in advance, but then they got some bad news. We were like, uh, why are they emailing us? Like, do we want to open this email? No way, are you kidding me? Just a few months before All-Star Weekend, the room was canceled. Quote, the National Basketball Association signed a contract in 2018 that we inherited from a previous management company for 100% occupancy of our available rooms during the NBA All-Star Game. And once we got the cancellation, we had to tell her that that wasn't good. Mia cried. Her grandparents did everything right, way in advance. It's my honor to announce the 2023 All-Star Game will take place here in Salt Lake City. I don't think they care. They haven't showed it, I guess, money talks. You know, now they're talking thousands of dollars for, you know, one night, if you can find anything, but we haven't been able to find anything uptown. $1,000 a night if you can find anything. The family says they did get their money back and were offered a $25 off voucher in the future. Obviously, they say that's not going to cut it. But what they're really worried about is for everyone coming from out of town, at least for them, they're locals. Courtyard Marriott, we did send them an email. They have not responded. Reporting downtown, Adam Herpetz, Fox 13 News, Utah. A man had to be rescued after falling near Bridal Veil Falls just after 11 this morning. The Utah County Sheriff's Office says the man was climbing on Upper Falls, which is just east of Bridal Veil Falls, when he fell and broke his leg and injured his back. After a person who was in his climbing group was able to call for help, Crews were able to reach him, and after about three hours, they were able to get him down with the help of a helicopter. Because of the snow and the ice that's up in the area, that makes it not only more challenging, but also more risky in getting there. So we have to be very deliberate about our approach so that we don't uh, get in a hurry and, as a result, take a misstep that creates more of a problem than what we uh, had when we started. The climber was taken to Utah Valley Hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. One person is in the hospital after a four-car crash at the Salt Lake City International Airport. Investigators say a rental car company employee was moving a company vehicle, which had been modified for use by a person with disabilities, when the car veered into multiple parked cars. One passenger suffered a non-life-threatening injury. Investigators are still deciding if anyone will be charged in this crash. Making national headlines, the weekend's massive winter storm has claimed the lives of dozens of people across the country, and officials say those numbers will likely increase as cleanup continues. Fox's Alexis McAdams has a story. 
The death toll from last week's once in a generation winter storm expected to climb. This blizzard is the one for the ages. Certainly it is the blizzard of the century. Western New York, one of the hardest hit areas. No stranger to snow, but Greater Buffalo was paralyzed by this blizzard, blanketing that city in sheets of snow, knocking out power to thousands of homes and businesses and killing dozens of people. Their bodies discovered in their cars, inside homes, and even buried in snowbanks. It is painful uh, to find members of your community that are deceased. Emergency workers have already conducted hundreds of rescues, officials closing major highways and putting a driving ban in place to create safe passage for search and recovery teams, plows, utility crews, and first responders. The driving ban is in place not to inconvenience you, it's to help us get through this as quickly as possible, to open up communities so that we can get in uh, and do what we need to do so that we can open up as fast as possible. The storm, which began hitting the area on Friday, brought heavy wind and lake effect snow. Officials calling it the worst blizzard in more than four decades. And as folks try to dig out, they're dealing with a lingering Arctic freeze. Some have been without power since Friday. The most important thing is please stay at home for the next day. And it's not over yet. More snow is expected to fall on parts of western New York through Tuesday. In New York, I'm Alexis McAdams, Fox 13 News, Utah. Buffalo, New York, and Salt Lake City, Utah are cities known in large part for their snow, but in very different ways. So going in depth today, Fox 13 News anchor Max Roth looks at the difference between our snow and theirs. There's no question Salt Lake City and much of Utah can be described as snowy, but our famous snow sweeps through the dry desert into our high mountains, while Buffalo gets theirs blowing in from Canada over the icy Great Lakes. Buffalo and Salt Lake City both have long, proud histories. Each is defined by a nearby lake, Buffalo's Great Lake, Lake Erie, and Salt Lake City's Great Salt Lake. Both are close to world-famous natural wonders, Lake Erie and Niagara Falls for them, and too much to start a list for us, but when it comes to snow... Several states are under a state of emergency this Christmas. Utah is not one of those states. So far, our snow year is pretty good, meaning some of the driving can be rough, but we can still drive. So some facts about about the differences. The most snowfall in any location in each state ever recorded in Utah, 38 inches fell on Alta on December 2nd, 1982. In New York, Watertown got 49 inches overnight from November 14th to the 15th in 1900. And Watertown sits at 466 feet elevation, Alta at 8,560 feet. In Salt Lake City, the most precipitation ever from one day of snow was 1.36 inches in January of 1953. Buffalo got nearly two full inches on Christmas Eve this year, their new record. Salt Lake City's annual average snowfall is 58.2 inches. Buffalo's 94.2. So it's far more common in western New York for too much snow. Airports shut down and roads off limits. While in Utah, we worry about not getting enough. That's why when you look up National Weather Service data for each place in Buffalo, they worry about snow depth and storms. In Utah, there is a lot more focus on snow water equivalent and drought. In studio, Max Roth, Fox 13 News, Utah. Things are quiet out there right now, Dan, but I was racing around today trying to get all my errands in because I know Good. that the forecast is not going to be as favorable and we are going to be getting that snow that Max was talking about. That's right, and it'll be in the mountains and rain in the valleys to begin with. That's the good news. We have an atmospheric river out here. It's already pummeling Northern California with heavy rain, mountain snow, and what they call the Trinity Alps, and also the Siskiyous, and uh, they get a lot of snow when these storms come in with atmospheric rivers. For us though, ah, all right, let's talk about Buffalo. Just some very light snow showers. I wanted to mention over four inches of measurable precipitation and likely up to as much as uh, 60 inches of snow in a few places. So again, breaks in the clouds over us tonight. How much snow can we expect? By Wednesday, we're getting into the 12 to 18 inch range in some of our mountains, even some snow in the valleys. Let's go into, uh, let's see, Thursday, and we're getting up into the, uh, oh, up to a three feet, and this is just half of the storm cycle. So we're just barely getting to the point where we'll start to see the snow heavy at times in the mountains. So a little haze today, 
That'll clean up tomorrow with the winds coming in, a tad cooler stormy for the rest of the week. More details on that extended forecast. You'll want to see it coming up just a minute. Back to you, Abe. Dan, thank you. Also coming up, he's been a household name in Utah for more than 18 years. Now he's being named Utah of the Year. Why the Salt Lake Tribune chose coach Kyle Whittingham in 2022. And the numbers are in. How much blood was donated in our holiday blood drive last week? As University of Utah football coach Kyle Whittingham prepares to head to the Rose Bowl for the second year in a row, he may have to take some time off to celebrate his latest accolade, Utah of the Year. The Salt Lake Tribune awarded Kyle Whittingham the title this weekend. The Tribune highlighted the coach's ability to take teams of people from different backgrounds and beliefs and turn them into a family that works for a common goal. Coach Whittingham and the Utes take on Penn State in the Rose Bowl next Monday, January 2nd. Fox 13 News coverage from Pasadena, California begins on New Year's Eve. We want to thank you for showing up for our holiday blood drive last week. Fox 13 News partnered with the Red Cross and 93.3 The Bull to collect 212 units of life-saving blood. With so many people traveling, the so-called triple-demic and bad weather across the country right now, the Red Cross says donations are way down, but the need for blood remains high over the holidays. You can make an appointment to give online at redcross.org. Still ahead, the holidays can be hard on our hearts, figuratively and literally, what you can do to keep your hearts healthy this week. Russia says it shot down a Ukrainian drone in Russian territory, killing three Russian service members. I'm Nate Foy in Kiev, Ukraine. I have the details coming up. Russia is claiming to have fended off a Ukrainian operation within its own borders. Fox's Nate Foy is in Kiev with the latest. In an early morning strike, Russia says it shot down a Ukrainian drone approaching a Russian airbase hundreds of miles past the border. Russia says three servicemen were killed by drone debris at the airbase that houses nuclear capable strategic bombers used in airstrikes on Ukraine. The incident raises questions about the capability of Russia's air defenses if a Ukrainian drone can travel that far. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin says Moscow is open to a new round of talks to end the war. But with Russian missile attacks continuing to hit Ukraine on a regular basis, a peace agreement seems unlikely. In Ukraine's east, the governor of the Luhansk region says the Russian occupiers did not prepare residents for winter, leaving them to fend for themselves to stave off the bitter cold. Trees have almost disappeared in the cities because local residents use firewood to heat their homes. It is now deadly and dangerous to go into forests because everything there is mined. In a Christmas Day address, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky thanked his countrymen for keeping up the fight. There are only a few days left this year. We must be aware that our enemy will try to make this time dark and difficult for us. I know the darkness will not prevent us from leading the occupiers to their new defeats. There are growing fears about possible retaliatory airstrikes from Russia after the Russian airbase was targeted this morning. Reporting in Kiev, Ukraine, I'm Nate Foy, Fox 13 News, Utah. Today, health officials in China announced that as of January 8th, they will drop all major COVID-19 quarantine measures for international passengers. It's a major step towards opening up the world to once again, for the first time since 2020, travelers will need to get a negative COVID test within 48 hours of departure. But that's a far cry from the current situation where travelers need to isolate for eight days, five of them in a designated quarantine hotel, followed by three days at home. The holidays are not only heartwarming, but also a warning for your actual heart. The American Heart Association reports that more people die of heart attacks between December 25th and January 1st than any other time of the year. And people who have survived heart attacks say it can be life or death if we don't slow down life and listen to our bodies. Claire Kopsky from our sister station in Nashville reports. Before August 14th, 2020, I was, the only medications that I ever took was for a headache. 
Advil. And now I have six heart-related medications. It was on that date that 51 year John Dietrich felt different while at work. At one point, I had to go out in my truck and lay there for 30 minutes. And fast forward to the end of the day, I was still having the heart is heartburn issues and felt a little tingly. The pain my, was centralized in his head. chest and he soon found himself in the ER. If you mention the word heart, as soon as you go into the ER, you kind of get fast forward and get to the front of the line. Turns out John was having a heart attack. The artery that pumps blood to his heart was 100% blocked. He was lucky to survive. Many people don't. This type of heart attack is called a widowmaker for obvious reasons. You didn't have time to say your last farewell or, or goodbye to anybody, like loved ones. And that, you know, after thinking about that at the time, that was hard. That was really hard to think about. He admits at that point in his life, his stress was at an all time high. And even though the gym was part of his routine, his health wasn't his top priority. Sometimes we, we take care of other people, we don't take care of ourselves. Stress for any of us can be high at all times of the year. But when we know the stress is coming, cardiologists say we need to prepare. And you should not put good habits on a holiday. Dr. Daniel Munoz is the medical director at Vanderbilt's Heart and Vascular Institute. He suggests maintaining the healthy habits we do throughout the year and enjoying holiday treats in moderation. Typically, that period from uh, the Christmas holiday for many people and New Year's is thought of as a time of peace, of tranquility. Ironically, during that week alone, we see as many if not more heart attacks than on any other week during the year, just reinforcing the importance of good self-care, good self-maintenance. Uh, I might even say that we should all plan for both peace on earth and goodwill towards yourself during that week. A reminder to take care of your heart so you can enjoy the holiday season. Heart disease does not discriminate and it's for real. Tell your loved ones you love them every day because you don't know if you're going to see them mm -hmm. when you come home. In Nashville, I'm Claire Kopsky reporting. Yeah, speaking of heart, speaking of heart attacks, you know, we've seen a lot of snow fall and people shoveling snow and that tends yes. to um, pose problems for people yes, who might does. have a heart attack while doing that. Yeah, especially early in the day, like, you know, after you get up and go out and clear the walks, that's when we have a lot of heart attacks. Why not think about hiring your neighbor youngster to come over and help you out? I mean, pay them well because they could save your life. We have the atmospheric river coming in. This right here is the bloodline of a very heavy rain event, literally, in California. Up to 10 inches of rain will fall in some of the coastal areas of California with anywhere from six to probably nine feet of snow by this time, I would say next week. And some of this is going to work its way into Utah, but it will take until tomorrow before that leading edge reaches us. And it has to go over the Sierra and we lose a lot of that moisture when the storms come in from the west, even though they're tapping tropical moisture, tapping that, um, that atmospheric river, we don't often see the big precipitation here like they do in California. It needs to go around the bottom of the Sierra, come up through St. George, and then get us. And there's one of those in the forecast. I'm a little concerned we'll see freezing rain in Roosevelt, Vernal, Neola, those areas. So keep that in mind as the storm moves in. It'll be just a little bit of freezing rain. We'll be mostly rain Salt Lake City. We're 43 degrees, mostly snow above about 6,500 feet, and that's mainly north of I-70. This storm will not impact southern Utah, this first storm. Now, we do have air quality issues. We're unhealthy right now, and we'll go good for Tuesday and Wednesday. Just wanted to alert you to that. 53 in St. George as we speak, no wind. 43 in Salt Lake City and a little southeast wind. Here's the storm forecast. Look at this massive amount of uh, atmospheric river. Now, as it comes into Utah, just kind of watch it. It just kind of just pops in, boom. But by the time it reaches us, it's not nearly as impactful. In fact, it's dropping right here and it comes over the Sierra. You kind of lose that. You get a downsloping effect. And so we get the precipitation, but not the real heavy um, concrete snow like the Sierra Nevada gets. <laughs> Then it turns to snow on Wednesday. Thursday, we'll get a little teeny break. Friday, Thursday night into Friday, a couple of storms come in. And then here's another atmospheric river. Let's see where it goes. Oh, look at that. It goes south. This is going to get around the Sierra, back up into Utah. And this one's going to produce snow at times Saturday, Sunday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, okay. 
and southern Utah gets hit the hardest. And then we'll see additional precipitation coming in on Tuesday and on Wednesday of next week. So they're lining up. Okay, temperatures tomorrow quite warm with that gusty southerly wind, St. George. It'll be 61, then dropping to 51 with rain Wednesday. We'll have heavier rain Friday, Saturday, Sunday with a little break on Monday, turning much cooler. Salt Lake City, 49 tomorrow, 39 Wednesday with rain changing over to snow down on the valley floor briefly. And then Thursday's kind of an in-between day and then snow at times on Friday, Saturday, Sunday with a break on Monday. I have to tell you, Friday, the computer models say four inches, four inches Saturday and eight inches on Sunday. I don't know if I believe that. We'll have to see what happens. And now I'm supposed to do this. Do you know what that is? A break. It's time for a commercial break. We'll, we'll be right back. Stock markets and banks were closed today in observance of the federal Christmas holiday. Tomorrow will be a regular business day. We'll see the release of pending home sales figures on Wednesday. That may indicate how much the already slumping housing is faring. Initial and continuing jobless figures will be made public Thursday. So far, the job market has done surprisingly well, despite Federal Reserve efforts to slow the economy in the fight against inflation. One set of beneficiaries of the $1.7 trillion spending bill that passed Friday will be retirees. A savings fit measure in the bill is designed to ensure greater retirement plan participation by making it easier to opt into or out of plans. It also allows some workers to pay off their student loan debt and get matching contributions from employers for that amount in retirement contributions. The bill also calls for an expansion of the tax deductible savers credit. Coming up after winning re-election, Utah Senator Mike Lee is one of the subjects of the final report from the January 6th committee. We'll have those details and expert reaction. And next year's legislative session is less than a month away. We'll preview some of the bills that Utah lawmakers are planning to bring forward. January 6th committee final report and interview transcripts spend time talking about two Utahns. Fox 13 investigative reporter Nate Carlisle tells us who and what they've said. This is Utah Senator Mike Lee and Kaysville resident Janet Bueller. One, according to the January 6th committee, worked to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election. The other was convicted of a crime. Let's start with Lee. There is absolutely nothing to the idea uh, that I would have ever supported, ever, ever did support the fake electors plot. Nothing. The committee said it was more complicated than that. While Lee appeared to be unwilling to accept just anyone showing up claiming to be an elector for Trump, the final committee report says Senator Lee had spent a month encouraging the idea of having state legislatures endorse competing electors for Trump. Lee's spokesman today told Fox 13 News the senator was unavailable for an interview, but that Lee didn't encourage state legislatures to do anything. But Lee's own text messages, which have been reported on by CNN and others, says he was spending 14 hours a day contacting state legislators inquiring if they would send electors for Trump. Senator Lee's idea was that we could ignore the outcome of the presidential election, especially in swing states like uh, Arizona and Georgia. Chris Peterson is a University of Utah law professor and was the 2020 Democratic Party nominee for Utah governor. And instead just have the state legislatures send an alternative slate of electors back to Washington to elect a different president than the one that the, the public voted for in, in those states. It's a radical and, uh, uh, in my view, somewhat bizarre interpretation of the Constitution that amounts to an, a, a legal plot to overturn the election. It's dangerous and it's misguided. The committee also released a transcript of its interview with Janet Bueller, who pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor related to entering the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. She described her political activism during Trump's presidential term as zero. But, she said, I was just concerned because the election went differently than other elections I remember. Just usually we knew by the end of that day who the winner was. But it went on for weeks. And even in Utah, we had a house race that took weeks for them to finish counting. 
That's a reference. What we do know so far is that Burgess Owens has moved ahead in the vote count. To the 2020 congressional election between Burgess Owens and Ben McAdams. McAdams conceded 13 days after the polls closed. Bueller went to Washington, D.C. at the invitation of her stepson-in-law, former Salt Lake City police detective Michael Harden. And, she said, out of the idea of creating better relationships in the family, that's why I went. And if she had known the Stop the Steal rally would be violent, I would not have gone, she told the committee. Bueller described attending the Stop the Steal rally. Then she and Harden walked to the Capitol. Here's the portion of Bueller's testimony the January 6th committee played at a hearing in July. This woman comes up to the side of us and she says, Pence folded. So it was kind of like, okay, well, in my mind, I was thinking, well, that's it, you know. Well, my son-in-law looks at me and he says, I want to go in. Mueller and Harden were in the Capitol for about 30 minutes. Neither was accused of violence or destruction that day. Mueller received 30 days in jail and 36 months of probation. Harden did not receive jail. Instead, he got 18 months of probation and 60 hours of community service. Mueller told the committee she regretted traveling to Washington. As for Lee, he ultimately voted to certify the 2020 presidential election. In the studio, Nate Carlisle, Fox 13 News, Utah. Just over three weeks away from Utah's legislative session and lawmakers have been introducing new bills. One bill would create a waiting period to purchase an assault rifle. Taylorsville Representative Karen Kwan has proposed a 10-day waiting period with exceptions for law enforcement and concealed weapons permit holders who have undergone background checks. A similar bill on Capitol Hill creates a five-day waiting period on all firearm purchases. Clearfield Representative Carrie Ann Listenby is proposing to waive fees for school employees who want to become concealed weapon permit holders. That would apply to all public, private, and charter school employees. The bill carries a $23,000 price tag. That money would go to the State Bureau of Criminal Identification for the cost of background checks. Another bill would tweak the holiday schedule for parents who share custody of children. Yes, it is spilled out in the state law what holiday schedules can look like for children in divorce situations. Woods Cross Senator Todd Weiler's bill would tweak some parent time to end on 7 p.m. the night of a holiday itself for days such as Labor Day, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, President's Day, and Memorial Day. Another bill could require children who are interrogated by police officers to be read their rights. Cottonwood Heights Senator Kathleen Reby is proposing to require that all juveniles be made aware of their right to remain silent before being questioned. But she's also proposing to extend the length of time juveniles can be held if they're in the middle of an interrogation. Right now, it maxes out at two hours. A bill that would eliminate the state portion of the sales tax on food is back on Utah's Capitol Hill. West Valley City Representative Judy Weeks Rauner is trying again to get the bill passed. It has some public support but has failed to gain traction in the state legislature in the past. Still, the bill has been filed again to be considered in the 2023 legislative session. A state lawmaker is proposing to legalize beer delivery services in Utah. Salt Lake City Representative Joel Briscoe's bill would allow beer to be sold and delivered to people's homes. It would have limits on hours and, of course, only people over 21 with a valid ID could purchase it. The purchases would be tracked and records would be kept for a year under the proposed bill. A state lawmaker is proposing to rename Utah State University's campus in eastern Utah. Price Representative Christine Watkins wants it to be named or renamed to be USU Price. Utah State University's regional campuses have undergone name changes lately. There's also USU Blanding and USU Moab. Coming up, a Utah small business expanding against all odds. How this restaurant is managing to grow across the United States. 
According to Forbes, one in five small businesses will not survive beyond their first year, and 50% fail within five years. But that isn't the case for one Utah quick service restaurant with humble beginnings. Fox 13 News anchor John Franke went to Orem to find out how Cup Pop is growing in an uncertain economy. From local food truck to national chain, this Utah business is not afraid to take the country by storm. Korean barbecue in a cup. It's a simple concept. Every menu comes with rice, cabbage, noodles, and a protein of the customer's choice. Designed for people on the go. Is rooted in this one little part of town in Korea. And it's a town where you know, a lot of students studying for national exams. And it all began here in 2013 as a food truck in Provo. Founder John Song had to get creative to attract the first customer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. There was a buzz created of this, okay, these, this Korean truck, the founders are dancing in front of the truck, it's fun. And so that kind of took off. Doc Kwan has partnered with Song to help the company grow, and it has. The one food truck expanded to 10 Utah locations. Now Cup Bop boasts 47 brick and mortar restaurants in Arizona, Idaho, Nevada, Colorado, Oklahoma, and dozens more on the other side of the globe in Indonesia. The growth is only accelerating. Our goal is to become the first Korean food concept to become a national brand here in the U.S. For us to be able to do that, we absolutely need to get the middle of the country and the south. But with costs these days skyrocketing, Protein costs, beef has gone, at one point it was ex essentially double the price. Doc says the growth has to be smart. For us, number one's always survival. You gotta survive, you cannot lose money, you gotta make money to be able to continue to succeed, right? And when you start off with rents that are sky high, the risk is very high. And the product must deliver. Never compromise, obviously, with, our, with the quality of our food, because that's the number one thing that our customers are expecting. So if you're traveling, don't be surprised if you see this logo with deep Utah roots as the rest of the country experiences the taste that Utahns have enjoyed for a decade. It's an awesome feeling, it really is, to see customers 195. really enjoy our food and become fans and come back over and over again. So what's next? Well, Doc tells me the goal is to have a cup up location in every state in the country. In Orem, John Franke, Fox 13 News, Utah. And we have several atmospheric rivers. Those are big tropical plumes of moisture heading towards the Beehive State. What does that mean for it, for travel or for what you have in store for your clearing the sidewalks? I'll let you know in just a little bit. I'm Andrea Urban and the Utah State Aggies are playing in the Serve Pro First Responders Bowl tomorrow. Hear from the team on how they plan to finish the season on a high note. Plus, the Utah Jazz are in San Antonio tonight and after missing two weeks and then dropping 18 on Thursday, we take a look at what drives Colin Sexton to be the player that he is next in sports. I'm meteorologist Dan Pope. Take a look at this atmospheric river all the way out, way past Hawaii. That's slamming the California coast right now. We're in between, we'll have a lot of clouds. There's some inversion and also haze in the urban areas. We're gonna keep an eye on that for you. Temperatures are coldest in the basin. That's where we may see some freezing rain if the precipitation manages to get over the Wasatch Plateau and the Wasatch Mountains and the Uintas. In the meantime, there may be a little freezing rain in the Bear Lake Valley as well as in uh, Logan. All of this will be rain because the snow levels are going to be way up high above about 6,500 to 7,000 feet to begin with. So here are your temperatures around the state and the air quality, as I mentioned today, not so good. It does improve though with the wind tomorrow and stays good the rest of the week. 53 in St. George at this time. Didn't warm up much today. A lot of clouds kind of keeping the temperatures down. Here's our storm track. It comes in. This is our setup right here. There you go, Tuesday, rain in the valley, snow in the mountains, snow on Wednesday. Okay, Thursday's kind of an in-between day. And then here's more snow Friday. The computer models are saying several inches of snow Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Look at this atmospheric river forming here. It goes way back over to the Hawaiian Islands. Here it comes into southern Utah. It hits Arizona, and we're on the fringe of getting more snow on Sunday. So. 
<laughs> okay, let me keep going. There's Monday, there's Tuesday, and there's Wednesday. So we're just lining the storms up like crazy. Temperatures for tomorrow are going to be 24 in Vernal. Like I said, a few little snow showers or maybe some freezing rain in this area. Most everybody else will see the winds blow and that'll clean out the inversion and help to uh, keep it as rain in most of our valley locations on Wednesday. And it will rain a bit in southern Utah Wednesday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, big rains, maybe over an inch of rain in St. George, which is substantial, and a t one to three feet of snow in the southern mountains by Sunday. And more showers Monday into Tuesday, Wednesday. For us, rain tomorrow. It'll be rain in the valleys and snow in the mountains above 6,500 to 7,000 feet. Then the rain will mix with and turn over to snow Wednesday. Whether or not it accumulates on the valley floor depends on how quickly that changeover happens. The benches certainly will see some snow. Uh, valley floors, maybe not so much. Scattered showers on Thursday and then periods of snow Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And as I mentioned, the computer models are going a little bit wild right now. They think four inches, four inches, and eight inches on those three days. I'll believe it when I see it. Bottom line is, it'll be stormy and... Uh, how do I lead into sports with Stormy? Well, hopefully the Jazz are going to storm in and win their next game or something like that. Hey, that was perfect. You should get over here. The Utah Jazz are in San Antonio tonight after missing two weeks due to a hamstring injury. Colin Sexton returned last Thursday and the Jazz delivered and he delivered a significant scoring in his limited playing time, 18 points in just 17 minutes. Yeah, Utah Jazz guard Mike Conley said that even during those two weeks off, Colin Sexton was putting in the work. He was 100% Colin, you know, just the uh the workman's mentality of you know every day he was in early and leaving late and watching film and just trying to learn and soak up anything he can he truthfully is just a gym rat i think our training staff had to keep him out of doing a, a few things because he was you know afraid of overworking him so you know i think that's why he was such a seamless transition for him to come back he just you know didn't skip a beat and he's been ready and uh excited for for a chance to play Looking forward to that game tipping off in just about 10 minutes here. And after winning the Mountain West title last year, the Utah State Aggies had a roller coaster of a season. First starting four and one and then winning five and finishing six and six. So USU became bowl eligible and they play in the first responders bowl tomorrow afternoon. And they didn't finish with the record that they'd hoped for, but it says a lot about this team to quite literally turn this season around. I think we just have a guy, team full of guys who love playing football, love being around each other. So to have one more opportunity to be with the guys, we love that. We love just the daily process of practicing, getting better. For myself, this is my last game. Just to, you know, be able to kind of impart a legacy on the guys that are coming back and help them take the next step for next year. You know, that's something that we're all really, really looking forward to in this bowl process. Records can be deceiving. I, I think we're... Uh a better team than our record indicates. You know, just a lot of things that, that kind of uh, hindered us early in the year from being who we needed to be. We've played much better down the stretch and nothing will be, you know, more exciting to see these guys have a bowl championship. And today, Kyle Whittingham was named Utah of the Year by the Salt Lake Tribune. The Trib says Coach Witt earned this award because of the family culture that he has built at the U. He embodies work ethic, integrity, and competitive nature that makes him an ideal Utah. Kyle Whittingham is also nominated for Coach of the Year in college football, an award that he won last in 2019. Coach Witt in the Utes face Penn State in the Rose Bowl on Monday, January 2nd. I will be in Pasadena bringing you all that you need to know from the coaches, players, fans, and more. And I'm excited to ring in the new year smelling roses. That'll do it for sports. We'll be right back. Finally, today is National Candy Cane Day. It's observed every mm. year on the day after Christmas. Candy canes were first associated with Christmas as early as 1874 and started hanging on Christmas trees as early as 1882. You, you said yum, Dan. I did, but I've had so much candy. I'm done. And we are too. Bye, guys. <laughs>